Today we're in chapter 24, verses 44 through 53. I'll begin reading here in Luke chapter 24 at verse 44. I'll read to verse 48, and then we'll get into our study. Luke chapter 24, beginning at verse 44, reading to verse 48. Luke writes, Then he said to them, These are the words which I spoke to you while I was still with you, that all things must be fulfilled which were written in the law of Moses and the prophets and the Psalms concerning me. And he opened their understanding that they might comprehend the Scriptures. Then he said to them, Thus it is written, and thus it was necessary for the Christ to suffer and to rise from the dead the third day, and that repentance and remission of sins should be preached in his name to all nations, beginning at Jerusalem. And you are witnesses of these things." You know, I, I was thinking as I was preparing this study, I was thinking how often I, I share with you that we need as believers to, to know the Word of God, that we as believers ought to read the Word, study the Word, uh, memorize the Word. There's a variety of things that I encourage us to as we go through our studies in the Bible as it relates to, uh, to Scripture. You see, this here, as we're looking at it, as Jesus is saying in verse 44, these are the words which I spoke to you while I was still with you, that all things must be fulfilled. Well, the fulfilling of Scripture is a major theme of the Gospel of Luke. It's something that Luke, the writer, has been pointing to from chapter 1 all the way to the conclusion that Jesus' ministry, what he did, his life, his words, his actions, um, were basically uh, things that were fulfilling the Word of God. And so the Word of God is very important. And as I was thinking about this, I thought, I, I very seldom, if ever, do I really ever give you little basics about the Word of God and why it's important. So I thought I'd begin today by just sharing a couple of basic things about the Bible with you and then moving into its application. Um, there's some things that you probably already know but perhaps don't really know or haven't heard before. We know that, for example... When the Jews were studying the Bible, that they actually, having just the Old Testament, they basically divided the Old Testament into three sections. We know that as they divided the, the Bible into three sections, it was divided into the law, the prophets, and what is called the writings. Now, Jesus is speaking about that when he says in verse 44, uh, while I was still with you, that all things must be fulfilled which were written in the law of Moses, the prophets, and the Psalms concerning me. Well, the Psalms were part of what the Jews would call the writings. And so when he was speaking here, he's speaking about the totality of the Word of God. And knowing that the Jews divided the Old Testament into these three categories, the law or the Torah, which consisted of the first five books of Moses, the prophets uh, were, the, were those who wrote to the nation words of rebuke and encouragement as well as prophecies. And and the writings which contain the poetic books of Psalms and Proverbs, the book of Job, Song of Songs, various other writings. Well, basically, Jesus is saying that these writings were speaking of Him. The 39 books you find in the Old Testament are divided in a variety of ways. Five of them are called books of the law. Twelve of them are called historical books. Five of them are poetic books, and 17 of them are prophetic so these books are divided into three sections. Now, the New Testament contains 27 books. Five of the books are referred to as historical. You have Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, as well as the book of Acts. All of those are regarded as being historical books. You also have letters. We also refer to them as epistles. When you're writing, reading the Bible, perhaps it says the epistle of, of Paul to the Galatians. The word epistle simply means the letter. There are 21 letters that you find in the New Testament, and then you have one book that is specifically prophetic, and we know that that is the book of Revelation. And so what you have is you have 39 Old Testament books, you have 27 New Testament books, 66 altogether. Now, we call it the Bible. I wonder if you've ever wondered why it's called the Bible. The reason that we call the, this book that we have before us Bible is very simply put because the word Bible comes from a Greek word, biblos. And so that simply means the book or the scroll. And so we refer to this as the book, the Bible. Now, we often think of this book as simply a single book. In reality, what you have is 66 books. 66 books that make up the one book that is referred to 
as the Bible. A lot of times people will say, well, you know, I, I've been reading the Bible. The reality is that the word Bible speaks of the book or the scroll. You're actually reading, when you read Genesis, you're reading the book of Genesis or you're reading the book of Exodus, you see. And all through that, you actually are having 66 single books that are compiled into one book that is called the Bible. It was written over a period of around 1,500 years. And it is actually written by or has 40 different contributors. It was written by 40 different writers. It has uh, three different languages that you'll find, Hebrew, Aramaic, and Greek. It was written by a variety of people in different stations in life. You have kings who contributed. You have shepherds and fishermen. You have politicians and scholars. You have farmers. All of these are people that God moved by His Holy Spirit to write the books that we have here that we call the Bible. Sixty-six books, various languages, various contributors, written over 15 centuries in three languages. Sixty-six books making up the one book, the one book that has the one central message, which is redemption, and that one book that has one uh, central person, which is Messiah, Jesus Christ. And so when you're looking at this book called the Bible, it's a book that has a theme of God working in history, bringing redemption to man through the central figure, Jesus Christ, a book that has accumulated over 15 centuries, three different languages, 40 different contributors, and yet you find no errors, no contradictions. You find just a solid witness. I mean, if I took five persons in this room, if I had five people and I, and I whispered in one of their ears, uh, you know, a sentence, and then you just allow them to repeat what they heard, by the time it got to the fifth person, it would be a garbled message. There's no way that they would give a verbatim message that I had given to them. There's no way they'd be able to do that. And that would be just five people over five minutes. But we, we have here a, a book that was written in three languages, 40 different contributors over 15 centuries with one central theme one central person. And that's why Jesus Christ points out the Word of God to His people. Notice with me that He isn't saying to them, you can feel it in your heart. You can know beyond a shadow of a doubt by your emotions that I'm Messiah. He did not say that. Nowhere in the Bible do we ever find any indication that we are to live by our feelings. Nowhere. What we have is fact. The Word of God that has been declared to us by God Himself. What we have is faith, that we trust this Word of God is the Word of God, and then what we have is a feelings that can be associated with fact and faith. But we don't go by our feelings. I'm a believer not because I feel like a Christian. I'm a believer because I've trusted God's Word, and that's what Jesus Christ is pointing to. And that's one of the big dangers we have, by the way, in our society today in the end of the age. That's one of the problems we're having today because a lot of people are going by feelings and not by faith. A lot of people will go to a church based on how they feel when they get in and when they get out. It has nothing to do with whether the truth is being taught to them or not. It's how they felt throughout the message. If they feel good, then they come back. If they don't feel good, they go someplace else because their whole life is based on feelings. But God doesn't anywhere give to us any indication that that's how we're supposed to live our lives, by the things that we feel. I feel this, therefore it's okay. No, what I have to do is trust God's Word to be true, and I hold fast to that, and as a result of that, then I have the sense of contentment and peace that He gives to me because I've trusted in Him. So when Jesus is speaking here, what He wants to do is He wants to reinforce in the mind of His disciples that they can trust Him because He is the center of Scripture because prophecy has been fulfilled in Him. You see, He's presenting the Word of God now as proof, proof of who He is, and, and proof of what he has done. And notice with me, he directs his disciples' attention to God's word and how he fulfilled God's promises. And again, it's because it's through faith in God and his word that they will be saved. On one occasion in the Gospel of John in chapter 5, Jesus was speaking and he was sharing various ways that, that, uh, that you would have testimonies concerning who he is. And in John chapter 5, verses 39 and 40, this is what he said. In John 5, verses 39 and 40, Jesus said, You search the Scriptures, 
for in them you think you have eternal life. And these are they which testify of me. But you're not willing to come to me that you may have life. You ransack the Bible. You, you go through it with a, a fine-tooth comb. You're able to speak concerning the law, the prophets, the writings. You're capable of doing that. You have teachings related to those things. But as you've ransacked the Scriptures, you have failed to see the central person of Scripture. You haven't seen me. And so it's possible to read the Bible and not see the author. It's possible for a person to read the Bible and not even get a glimpse of who Jesus Christ is. And so what he's saying here is, he's saying, I prepared you sufficiently for what you are now seeing. Uh, the things that I taught you are the things that you are now seeing. So he says, I, I, I spoke to you through Moses. You see, because Moses ha has declared many things in the law that are fulfilled in Jesus Christ. In, in the law, in, in the first five books of the Old Testament, you, you have things revealed like the priesthood. You have sacrificial offerings. You have worship. You have the tabernacle. You have the high priest. In, in the writings of Moses, you see so much that is, is foreshadowing Jesus Christ. The very first prophecy that you have related to Messiah is found in Genesis, in chapter 3, verse 15. It's, it's when the Lord God is speaking uh, in this way, and, and He's speaking to the woman, Eve, and He says, I will put enmity between you and the woman, and between your seed and her seed, he shall bru actually to Satan, He says, I will, I will, sh He shall bruise your head, and you shall bruise His heel. So when God was cursing the serpent, He said, there is going to be enmity between you and and the seed of Eve, speaking of a human being, speaking of Messiah. You see that in Genesis chapter 3, verse 15, right from the beginning, God is stating that Messiah is going to come and is going to defeat Satan. He, he speaks concerning Messiah through the prophets. Isaiah is one that is quoted quite often. In Isaiah chapter 7, verse 14, Isaiah said, The Lord himself will give you a sign. Behold, the virgin shall conceive and bear a son. You shall call his name Emmanuel. Isaiah 9, verse 6, Unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given. The government will be upon his shoulder. His name will be called Wonderful, Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. Or Isaiah chapter 50, verse 6, where Messiah says, I gave my back to those who struck me, my cheeks to those who plucked out the beard. I did not hide my face from shame and spitting, for the Lord God will help me. Therefore, I will not be disgraced. Therefore, I have set my face like flint, and I know that I will not be ashamed. So he's speaking concerning how Jesus himself had, had uh, fulfilled uh, that, that which you found in the law, how that he fulfilled that which you found in the prophets, and how that he fulfilled that which was found in the Psalms or the writings. In Psalm 16, verse 10, you will not leave my soul in Sheol, nor will you allow your Holy One to see corruption. And so Jesus could point and did point to a variety of scriptures that you find in the writings, that you find in the prophets, that you find in the law of Moses. And he begins to point out these scriptures to the people so that they might see that they have a reasonable faith, that they can have a relationship with God based on his eternal word and his truth word. That's how you can know the Lord is through the word of God. It's never been through rituals. It's never been through religious exercises. Knowing God has always come through a direct connection with His Word, always has. God's Word goes forth. God preaches to us through His Word by His Spirit. He has a messenger who communicates it. We hear the message. Our hearts are convicted and convinced that what He's saying is true. We open our hearts to the Lord and we say, God, be merciful to me. I am a sinner. And God moves in our life. All of this requires his activity. Notice verse 45. And he opened their understanding that they might comprehend the Scriptures. He opened their understanding that they might comprehend the Scriptures. The word comprehend, it means to piece together. It means to perceive or to understand. Jesus, in other words, helped them put the pieces of the puzzle together. Jesus helped them to connect the scriptural dots. Jesus revealed these things to them because 
if he doesn't reveal these things, if he doesn't open their understanding that they might comprehend, then they're going to remain in spiritual darkness. It, it requires God to open the blinded spiritual eyes. And until he does, no matter what we read and no matter what we hear, we're still going to miss the point. He has to open our eyes that we might see. In the Old Testament book of 2 Kings, in chapter 6, there's a really interesting story there. It's a story that speaks of a king, a king of Syria. And the king of Syria was busy making war with the nation of Israel. There was a prophet during that time by the name of Elisha. And Elisha continually was warning the king of Israel concerning the plans of the king of Syria. And he would actually warn the king of Israel not to have his troops go in a certain area because traps were there. And so the king of Syria was getting very frustrated. And so what happens is he begins to think that one of his men is informing uh, on him. And he's wanting to know who is telling them, who is doing this, who's letting these people know about our plans. And so when he starts to say, who's informing on us? In 2 Kings chapter 6, verse 12, he receives the answer, none, my lord, O king, but Elijah the prophet who's in Israel tells the king of Israel the words that you speak in your bedroom. There's not a word that you can say in what you think is complete privacy because Elijah is aware of the things that you're saying. Well, the Syrians find out that it's Elijah, and then they find out where he is. He's in the city of Dothan, and so they send some troops there in order to get him while he's in that city. And they came to the city by night, and they surround that city. Now, as the troops, the Syrian troops are there surrounding Dothan, uh, Elisha's uh, servant, his minister there it, with him, sees these troops, and he gets absolutely petrified, and he cries out in fear, what are we going to do? I mean, we're dead meat. These people are surrounding us and we're, we're going to get caught. What are we going to do? Well, in 2 Kings chapter 6, verses 16 and 17, uh, he answered, Do not fear, for those who are with us are more than those who are with them. And Elisha prayed and said, Lord, I pray, open his eyes that he may see. Then the Lord opened the eyes of the young man, and he saw, and behold, the mountain was full of horses and chariots of fire all around Elisha. You see, unless God opens up our understanding, unless God opens up our eyes, unless God makes it possible for us to comprehend what the Scripture says, we're going to remain in spiritual darkness. But that's what he does. He actually opens up our understanding. That's what the Holy Spirit does, is he awakens us to the reality of the things of God. When Paul was writing about this in 1 Corinthians in chapter 2, verse 9 and 10, he says, As it is written, I has not seen, nor ear heard, nor have entered into the heart of man the things which God has prepared for those who love him. But God has revealed them to us through his Spirit. For the Spirit searches all things, yes, the deep things of God. God reveals these things to us. We are so blessed to live in a time when God actually will open up His mind to us, and He does it through the Word of God. We are blessed to live in a time when God reveals Himself to us, and He does it through our studies of the Word, through our prayerful memorization of Scripture, through our putting it into practice, through our coming to Bible studies like this. That's what He does. He speaks to us and opens our eyes and gives to us understanding. It's interesting how when the Apostle Paul was writing to the church of Ephesus in chapter 1, he actually prayed for the Ephesians, this believing church, and, and, and he said in Ephesians 1, 17, I pray that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give you the spirit of wisdom and revelation in the knowledge of Him. May God open our understanding May God give to us an understanding of the ways of God. May He reveal Himself to us in a deeper way. And He does that through His Spirit, and He does that through His Word. And that's what He's doing here. He's saying, listen, you need to know that everything that was written concerning me, 
The things that you find in the book of Moses, the things that you see in the writings, the things that you see in the prophets, these things were written concerning me. And he points their attention to the scriptures, perhaps like he had done on the road to Emmaus, sharing some things in detail with them. And then after they receive that, after they're hearing it, he opens their understanding and they finally have that aha moment where they're saying, so that's what he means. So that's how it works. I wonder how many of us in this room have had that kind of moment with the Lord where we finally kind of say, the spiritual blinders have been taken off. I finally see what you're talking about. It's taken a while, but now I see, Lord. I was once blind, but now I see. I, I didn't understand, but, but now I do. And that's what's happening there. In verse 46, he said to them, Thus it is written, and thus it was necessary for the Christ to suffer and to rise from the dead the third day, and that repentance and remission of sins should be preached in his name to all nations beginning at Jerusalem. You are witnesses of these things. Now, I want you to notice that he speaks about repentance and remission of sins should be preached. Again, we live in a time when the word preached is, is not a popular word. People don't like being preached to. Even the church doesn't like to be preached to. You know, it's an interesting thing, but it's true. You know, don't preach to me. I don't like you to preach to me. Don't be so preachy. You know, we use it as a negative word, and it's really not a negative word. It, it's a proclamation. It's actually a proclamation of some great news. It's a wonderful, wonderful testimony. I mean, the fact is, is that God has done something on our behalf. That's something that we ought to talk about. That's something that we ought to share with other people. It, it's something that Jesus wants us to speak about. And, and what he's talking about is he's talking about three basic things. There are three things that you emphasize when you're preaching this good news. And I want you to see these three things. He's emphasizing suffering. He's, he's emphasizing resurrection. And he's emphasizing repentance and remissions of sins. These are the three, three things that, that make up uh, this message that they're to take out. And I want you to notice verse 48 says it's to be proclaimed to all the nations, beginning in the city of Jerusalem. So that's the heart of the gospel. The heart of the gospel is that this message, a message that relates to the suffering of Jesus Christ, how that he took upon himself the sin of the world, how he carried a cross and died for us, the suffering of Christ is something that we ought to rejoice in because he did it for us. But not only that, but we speak about and, and we inhabit the reality of his resurrection, and then we take this suffering and this resurrection and proclaim it throughout the world. We tell people about it. I was watching, I don't know why I do this, but I was watching a TV program the other day. Uh, if I mention the name of the person, you might recognize his name. I won't mention his name, but it's a show uh, where this guy likes to go uh, around and um, sample the different cuisines of the world. I don't know why I'm watching. I can't eat the stuff he's eating. But as I was watching, I wouldn't eat the stuff he's eating. But as I was watching, I found it interesting because he was in French Indonesia. And, and he's talking about how beautiful that particular part of the world is, French Indonesia. And as he's going through the jungle, because a lot of it is, is jungle, it looks very much like... Um, like Hawaii or one of, the, uh, one of the beautiful Pacific Islands and all that. See, it is, you know, an island. But anyway, as he's going through that area, he, um, he's speaking to different people. And then he speaks to the camera and, and he's saying, you know, it's, th th these people had a beautiful, beautiful culture. And, uh, and he, then he goes like this and he says it's something like this. He goes, and then the missionaries came in. And, and basically what he was saying is the missionaries ruined their beautiful culture. Now, there are quite a number of people who would agree with that, by the way. You know, these missionaries came in and ruined the beautiful culture of these people. Lots of people would, would agree with what this guy was saying because he, he, he said it in such a way as to demean missionaries and their efforts to, to reach these people. But what I found ironic about this whole thing is he's standing next to a pit and as he's standing next to this pit with this, with this uh, native fella, he says, this pit here used to be used to keep the prisoners that were caught by the, the natives. They would put them in this pit, and they would keep them in the pit until they were ready to kill them and eat them. And I'm thinking, you idiot. If it weren't for the missionaries, you'd be in that pit. 
you know, you, you wouldn't be doing a travel show about things that you've eaten. It'll be about who ate you. I mean, that's how that's going to be. I mean, it made no sense to me. I mean, they're bemoaning Christianity. He's bemoaning the missionaries. He's saying that they ruined the culture. He's saying these people came in and ruined their culture and doesn't have a clue that he would be in one of their pots right now if the missionaries hadn't have gone there and given the word of God to these people. That shows you how ridiculous it is. I mean, the fact is, is the Christian message has changed entire civilizations. Entire civilizations have been changed because of the goodness of God through the message of the gospel of Jesus Christ. People say, well, that Christian message really doesn't have any relevance to our society. It really doesn't have any value. I've had people write letters to the editor in response to things that I've written where they have said, you know, we don't think Christianity is necessary. We don't think that it's valuable. What, what's the whole point of having these preachers writing these things about this mythology and all? We don't think that Christianity has any value in our society at all today. And yet I remember somebody asking the question once when he said this, he said, let's put it this way. If you were walking at midnight in one of the toughest parts of town and you were walking through an alley on your way home, there's no lights there. You're halfway into the alley and there's no turning back. When three men come walking towards you, they're good-sized men coming out of the darkness and there's no way you can get away from them. They're about to be upon you. And then the question is asked, would it make any difference in the way that you think if you found out that these are three men who are just returning home from a Bible study? Would it make any difference to you? The obvious answer is it would make every difference in the world to me. If these are believers coming home from a Bible study, yeah, because they're more prone to help me than to hurt me. Of course I, it makes a difference. Christianity makes a difference in the society that we live in. And it's a message that is centered on Jesus Christ. Jesus who suffered on a cross for us. Jesus who took upon himself my sin in order that he might die on my behalf, that he might pay a penalty that I could know I could not pay myself, that he might satisfy the demands of a righteous and perfect God completely. And he suffered on that cross for me. He took the stripes for me. He took the crown of thorns for me. He took the, he took the, the, the cross itself, the nails. He took it all for me. Does it matter? Yes. And yes, we preach the suffering of Christ. And yes, we speak of his resurrection because he was raised from the dead. And yes, we take this message throughout the world that if people can repent from their sins, God will forgive them. God will forgive them of their sins. God forgives every sin. There isn't a sin that he can't forgive. The only sins that are not forgiven are the ones that we just, we just refuse to confess our sins to him. How can he forgive us if we refuse to say, please forgive me? But me, I said, God, please forgive me a sinner. And indeed, the Bible makes it very clear. If I confess my sin, he is faithful and just to forgive me my sin and to cleanse me from all unrighteousness. And so I took him up on his promise. And that's what Jesus is saying here. He's saying, you're going to go out throughout the whole world and you're going to share about my suffering. You're going to share about my resurrection. And you're going to give people hope through repentance because they can have the remission of sins. And you're going to take this message not just in the city of Jerusalem, but this is a message that's intended to go from Jerusalem to Judea to Samaria and unto the uttermost parts of the earth. And you, he says in verse 48, you are witnesses of these things. Now, he's given to them a message, but he also needs to give them the ability to proclaim and remain faithful. So in verse 49, he says, Behold, I send the promise of my Father upon you, but tarry in the city of Jerusalem, until you are endued with power from on high. I send the promise of my Father. That word promise is an announcement. It's an announcement of divine assurance for good. The sending of the Spirit of God is God's announcement of good for those whom he loves. He says, I send the promise of my Father because God had promised the nation that he would send his Holy Spirit. The book of Joel, which was written 800 years before Christ, 
In Joel chapter 2, verses 28 and 29 says, It shall come to pass afterward that I will pour out my Spirit on all flesh. Your sons and your daughters shall prophesy. Your old men shall dream dreams. Your young men shall see visions. And also on my men servants and on my maid servants, I will pour out my Spirit in those days. This promise was reiterated 735 years before Christ through Isaiah. Isaiah 44, 3, I will pour water upon him who is thirsty and floods upon the dry ground. I will pour my spirit upon your seed, my blessing upon your offspring. Jesus is about to fulfill this promise by sending the Holy Spirit to empower them. Jesus said, I send the promise of my Father. So Jesus is what you would refer to as the Holy Ghost baptizer. In John 16, 7, he said, I tell you the truth, it's for your good that I'm going away. Unless I go away, the Comforter will not come to you. But if I go, I will send him to you. The baptism of the Holy Spirit. The power of the Holy Spirit. You cannot live a Christian life without the Holy Spirit. If there's anything missing in people's lives today that I, that I see quite often, it's the presence and the power of the Spirit of God in their life. I see a lot of Christians who are trying to live the um, victorious life through the efforts of their own flesh. They're trying to make themselves into solid Christians through their own fleshly efforts. And, and, and God never blesses our flesh. You see, the fruit of the Spirit and the power of the Spirit is something that comes through natural means of simply being in Christ. It, you're rooted and you're grounded in Him. And, and when you're rooted and grounded in the Lord, it's like the roots of a tree that go deeply into the earth. The natural reality is it's going to produce fruit. That's what happens. It, it naturally produces the fruit. It, have you ever walked by an apple tree and, an, or a lemon or an orange tree, and have you ever seen it shaking trying to form an orange or an apple? Have you ever seen that? Have you ever gone by, oh, man, that's really trying to produce... It doesn't happen that way, does it? I mean, it's a natural thing when it's watered, it's cared for, when it's trimmed, worked on, because it's rooted and grounded, it's natural for it to produce some beautiful fruit. And that's what happens. When, when you're walking with the Lord and, and you're in Christ and just enjoying and in peace with Him, the Lord begins to flow through your life. And Jesus is making it very clear here that if you're going to live for him and be the witness. If you're going to have a successful ministry, if you're going to be able to take the message and, and actually live it out and share it, it's going to require the Holy Spirit. It takes the power of the Holy Spirit to do that. You see, in the Old Testament, God chose to, to dwell amongst the people in the tabernacle and, and in the temple. And, and you read that in the Old Testament. You see how Moses had had built a portable tent, a place that was taken from place to place where they would put the Ark of the Covenant and the variety of things that were there in that tabernacle. But there were times that they would actually uh, take the tent and move on and then they'd plant it and once again God would meet with them in a certain area. And then later on, David uh, wanted the, uh, the temple to be built and his son Solomon built it for the Lord as an honor to the Lord. Now God had said, listen, he said, um, uh, the, God doesn't dwell in a temple made with human hands. You know, I'm, much, I'm, I'm not able to be contained in anything that you can make, but, but I am pleased to dwell amongst you in this particular place. And so in the Old Testament, God would dwell amongst the people um, as he chose in the tabernacle and as well as, as the temple. But it's interesting when you get into the New Testament that God says, you are my temple. And so because man cannot create a temple adequate for God, God created his own temple because he created man. And so when you and I asked Christ to be our Lord and our Savior and the Spirit of God dwelt within us, well, 1 Corinthians 3.16 says, we are now the temple of the Spirit of God and the Spirit of God dwells in us. And so you are the temple of God. You are exquisitely made. You are wonderfully made. God created his own temple and therefore he dwells within you. So as you go and 
about your daily life, the Lord within you is going along with you. I need power, though, to be a witness. I, I need His enduing with power in my life to have victory over the flesh that is constantly, that old sin nature that is constantly uh, fighting for, for uh, dominance, you know? And so I ask the Holy Spirit to, to empower me and, and to infill me, and Jesus is speaking concerning the need that we have to be endued, to have this power. You see, in verse 49, he says, tarry in the city of Jerusalem until you are endued with power from on high. That word endued uh, means to be clothed with, to have something on, to be arrayed in, to put something on yourself. You are to be arrayed in the power of the Holy Spirit. In other words, you are not to minister without the power of God clothing you. And that's simply because ministry never will never give glory to God if it's clothed with the flesh. So, what we do is we say, God, I want to be empowered by your Holy Spirit. And, and the interesting thing about it is I have seen so many things in, in my spiritual life that are just wrong. It's just, it, they were just wrong things, it, all flesh and, and no spirit. When I first got saved, I got saved in a revival. I got saved in a movement of revival here in the United States that is called the Jesus Movement back in 1970. And, and God was doing some incredible things. There were some amazing things. Some of the largest churches in the United States were actually birthed from the Jesus Movement. A lot of the fellows that we know that are friends of ours who have come and spoken here are people who are products of the Jesus Movement. The Greg Laurie's and the Raul Reese's and the Mike McIntosh's and Steve Mays's and, and the like. And many of them, as well as myself, come from that period of time where God did a tremendous movement. And, and, and it was all because what we wanted when we got saved was God. We wanted Him. We wanted fellowship with Him. We wanted relationship with Him. We wanted Him to empower us, to strengthen us, to be with us, to not believe us, and, and to work within us. We wanted God to have all of us. And that's what happened. He began to do some tremendous things. And I saw uh, fantastic things. And, and yet at the same time, I was introduced not only to the gentleness of the Spirit and how the Spirit can work, but I also s saw how the flesh can work and how it's confusing sometimes. See, what you see today on TV very often, unfortunately, is really more activity of the flesh than the Spirit. A lot of times people get really busy trying to do things, you know, and, and trying to accomplish things, and, and, and they're not even really moving in the power of the Spirit. They're not even alive in the things of God. A friend of mine recently was speaking about how, how he grew up on a farm, and some of you perhaps have seen this. I never have seen this, um, though I have had, my mom has seen it, and others have told me stories about what they've seen, but some of you perhaps have seen this. I haven't. But he was sharing how, how that, uh, he went to, to have dinner one time. They were going to eat chicken, and, and uh, the lady of the house went into the backyard and got two chickens and grabbed the chickens by the head and just spun them around. Have you seen that before? And pop the heads off the chicken. And the chicken hits the ground and takes off running. Now, my mom told me a story about that when she was a little girl, how that, that happened to her. The chicken chased her around the yard with no head. And my mom really was freaked out as a little girl because there it comes running after her. And, and this fellow was saying, uh, he's saying the funny thing about it is that chicken never had so much activity, but it didn't even know it was dead. Now, isn't that interesting? That thing ran all over the yard until it finally fell over dead. But he said, you never saw so much activity in something that was dead. And we have that saying, he's running around like a chicken with his head cut off because that's what they do. They run all over the place and then they die. And a lot of churches are chickens with their heads cut off. They are constantly moving around, doing one thing and another. It has all the appearance of life, when in reality, there's no spirit there. It's flesh. So, friends of mine and I were brand new Christians. We wanted as much of God as we could. Before we got saved, we used to party every day. All you needed to do is tell me where a party was and I was there. So now it's different. Now they're saying there's a Bible study someplace or a revival someplace. And we went to Long Beach. And I drove, and 
off we went to Long Beach and we got to this particular small church in, in the city of Long Beach and there's this evangelist, it's an African American church with this guest evangelist who was a, a husky white guy with a blonde pompadour, I, I'll never forget him. I don't even know if you know what a pompadour is. Uh, it, your hair is kind of pulled out, you know, it looks like a front of a 1953 Chevy. If you've ever seen one of those, it's kind of rounded like that and real slick guy. And he was behind the pulpit and he was raising his voice and he was shouting and, and there was a set of drums at the base of the platform and whenever he felt like it, he would stop preaching and he'd just start playing the drums. I'm a brand new Christian and I'm thinking, this is fun. And, and, he's, and he's doing that. Some lady says, you know, in my church, we march around the church behind the Christian flag. And so before you know it, we're all marching around the church, you know, behind this lady. And she's got the flag while this guy's playing the drums. It was quite an interesting time. All the things you'll never do here. <laughs> and so then he says, if you want the Holy Spirit, come up here. And I wanted more of the Spirit, so I went up there, and they had what they called a tearing kind of altar. It had a rail there, and we knelt there. And we knelt there for no less than a half hour to 45 minutes. And as we're kneeling there, I was from the Catholic Church. I had these Protestants next to me, and I knew I could out-kneel any one of them any day of the, <laughs> any day of the week. There's no way you're going to out-kneel me. And yet... You know, we were begging, we were pleading, we were crying out, we were shouting, we were doing everything we don't need to do to try and get more of God. And nothing's happening. And then the evangelist says, okay, form a line and come up and speak and share with people what just happened to you. And I'm there thinking nothing happened. Nothing happened. I can't lie. You know, I can't, I'm a Christian. How can I go up and make up a story I can't lie, but nothing happened. And I was praying, oh, God, what am I going to do? And people were in front of me, and they'd come up behind this mic, and they'd say, oh, I saw heaven open up. There were angels. You know, Gabriel came in, you know, uh, just one thing after another. And I'm there going, nothing happened. What should I do? Nothing happened. Oh, Lord, nothing happened. I'm going to disappoint them. All these people are saying these wonderful things. And, and I still remember standing in line, and I finally got behind the microphone, and I looked out at the people, and they looked back at me. And I said to them this. I always remember what I said. I said, I really can't put into words <laughs> what I just went through. That was 100% true. I really can't put into words what I just went through. And they looked back at me like, yeah, nothing happened to us either. You know, that kind of, <laughs> we had one of those moments, you know. You see, Jesus said that God will give the Spirit to those who ask. Not beg, not plead, not cry out, not shout out, not kneel for 45 minutes. I just want more of the Lord. My Father would give to me good gifts. And, and Jesus said, if, if your Father, if you then being evil fathers know how to give good gifts to your children, will not your heavenly Father give the Spirit to those who but ask? See, so from my perspective, it makes sense. I want to live for Christ. I want to be a witness. I want to be able to talk about the sufferings with understanding. I want to know his resurrection and the power thereof. I want to be able to take this to the world. I want to be his witness. How can this happen? He says you need to be endued with the power of the Spirit of God. That's how it happens. By saying, God, forgive me of my sins and fill me with your Holy Spirit. In John 15, verses 26 and 27, Jesus said, When the Comforter has come, whom I will send to you from the Father, even the Spirit of truth who proceeds from the Father, he shall testify of me, and you also shall bear witness because you have been with me from the beginning. To be his witnesses requires his power. Our lives need to evidence his presence. It's interesting how Jesus in Acts 1-8 said, ye shall be witnesses unto me. He didn't necessarily say you're going to go out just talking. He said you are going to be a living testimony. 
I need the power of the Holy Spirit to transform my life. You know, a lot of times I hear people on TV talking badly about Christians. It seems to be common sport. But I have come to the conclusion that these people who speak so meanly of Christians probably don't know any. They certainly don't know you. They haven't met me. I'm not like what they say Christians are. So I'm pretty sure they haven't really met any Christians because when you meet Christians, there's something about them that you won't forget. They're loving, they're compassionate, they're merciful, they're caring, they serve, they're generous. These are great people, Christians. But that all requires the Spirit's power. That's how that works. He said, you're going to be my witness and you're going to take this message, you're going to live it, and you're going to give it. In verse 59, he led them out as far as Bethany, which is a city just outside of the city there of Jerusalem on the eastern slope of the Mount of Olives. And he lifted up, or the western slope really is the east of Jerusalem. He lifted up his hands and blessed them. Now it came to pass, while well, he blessed them, that he was parted from them and carried up into heaven. They worshiped him, returned to Jerusalem with great joy, and were continually in the temple praising and blessing God. Amen. Now, this particular event is actually taking place 40 days after the resurrection. You see that in the book of Acts, chapter 1, verses 1 through 3. And he's walking with his disciples out to Bethany there on the eastern slope of the Mount of Olives. And he ascended into heaven. And these are people who, as followers of Jesus, are going to have certain earmarks. One is they worship Him. Two, they experience great joy. Three, they're continuously in the temple. And four, they are continuously praising and blessing God. The mark of believers, once again, guys, worshiping the Lord Jesus Christ, experiencing the great joy that comes through our sins being forgiven and our relationship with God being solid, continuously being in fellowship, worshiping God, the temple there, church today, gathering together, and having an attitude of gratitude, continuously praising and blessing God. Those are the marks of somebody who's walking in the Spirit, guys. Those are the marks. You worship Christ, you have great joy, you don't forsake the assembling of yourself together with other believers, and you have a life of praise and a life of blessing God as you live his message out and as you give it to others. And that makes a tremendous impact in a world that needs forgiveness and joy and peace. It makes a difference in a world that is lost when we walk in the Spirit. I encourage you to open your heart to God and receive the power of His Spirit even tonight.